We like to think of ourselves as the heart of Jamaica Plain. The Lauren Greeno House is hard to miss, a palatial estate sitting on nearly two acres of land at the busy intersection of Center and South Streets. It's a great house. It isn't frozen in one particular time period. This house has been lived in for a very long time. Now listed on the National Register of Historic Places, the home is run by the nonprofit that saved it nearly a century ago, the Jamaica Plain Tuesday Club. Dorothy Clark is one of the organization's volunteers. The women's club that purchased this property knew they were saving something very special. It is the oldest property of its kind in this part of Boston. The house is named for its two most prominent residents. Joshua Loring was the first. Commodore Loring was a British sympathizer, or a Tory. Loring was injured fighting for Britain's Royal Army, returned home to Massachusetts, and built the home in 1760. But he and his family only lived there for 14 years. Because they were British sympathizers, they were basically run out of town. <laughs> The property was then used by the Continental Forces and after the revolution, purchased by Mariah Foster Doan Greeno. That began the first of five generations of the Greeno family living at this property. Now there's a renewed effort to share the untold stories of all the people who lived here across four centuries. We were interested in a section of the basement that we didn't use. So we said that would be great for an archeological dig. And the discovery has just really made us all so very, very excited. This property has an incredible span of stories. Joe Bagley is Boston's city archaeologist. This is what's called a flake, and it's what breaks off while making stone tools. It's one of the local materials that actually is only found in Mattapan. It's called Mattapan Banded Rhyolite. It's a really exciting thing to see something probably thousands of years old. Archaeologists have previously found stone tools here connected to the Massachusetts tribe. Now they're working to improve how they interpret all of their findings. We want the community who's impacted by these stories to be the ones telling that story, a much more meaningful story, a much more accurate story. That quest for collaboration continues into findings dating to the 18th century, when historians believe the Loring family enslaved at least three people, London, Othello, and Phyllis. All we really know about them is what was mentioned in letters, but we don't really get a lot of their story. And there's probably others that weren't mentioned. Archaeology can really bring something to that story. What we really want to be able to look at in the ground is what things are those enslaved people making, using, and interacting with. Three of the artifacts that we have are actual things that people would have been eating off of. While Massachusetts abolished slavery in 1783, city historians say the Greeno family managed an end around, purchasing 16 years of servitude by a five-year-old black boy named Dick, reclassifying him as an apprentice. There's so much left to do in Boston, in the ground. The number of questions that haven't been answered or frankly even been asked yet is enormous. From colonial history to more modern times. All art is supposed to create reaction. Just a mile down Center Street from the Loring Greeno House is the Core Cannabis Museum, open since March of 2021. Executive Director April Arasati explains the museum's first exhibit. There's really no way to talk about cannabis without talking about incarceration. So American Warden is essentially an exploration of incarceration in America against the backdrop of cannabis prohibition. American Warden is situated next to Seed, a recreational cannabis dispensary Arasati runs with her partners Perry Higgins and JP native Tomas Gonzalez. We wanted to create this juxtaposition where you would have a legal market steps away from a jail cell and an exhibition that told you about how we got to this place and really memorialize what has happened in this country over the last several decades to people who engage with this plant. It was her experience caring for her mother, who was dying of breast cancer, that drew Arasati, a licensed attorney, to the cannabis industry. I really thought we could change the process of dying in this country by bringing people this gentle compound as opposed to some of the ones we use now. 
As she continued working in the industry, Arisati grew increasingly frustrated with U.S. drug policy. In America, despite housing only 5% of the world's population, we house 25% of its inmates. She hopes this exhibit helps simplify the FBI data on crime in the country. If you are any male born in America in this century, that's every mother's son in this country born in this century, has a 1 in 13 chance of ending up behind bars. Arisati also wants to inspire inspire visitors. We need to make some changes and that's what we hope will happen here, that people will have the facts and the information to create more reasonable drug policy. Jamaica Plain, she says, is a natural place for that movement to grow. When the ballot initiative came through, this community was one of the highest voters of yes to legalize cannabis. And we really wanted to do something in a place where there was meaning and in a community that we understood. And the Core Cannabis Museum is working on opening another exhibit right now at their second location, which is in Portland, Maine. Excellent. And back to the Lorraine Greno House. Uh, the next archaeology dig there by Boston's Architects will be an outhouse, which is very interesting. Apparently, centuries ago, people would throw their dishes there, and a few years ago, a concentration of porcelain was yeah. found in that outhouse. So hey. who knows what they could find there next? Sort of, well, that's not my job. Still ahead. <laughs>